Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask. With this, this week's guest is Mike Pacer. And Mike, first of all, welcome to the program. Thanks, Eddie. It's great being here. Mike and his wife, Lori, are the founders and directors of Evangelize All Ministries, an apostolate that promotes a powerful plan for parish evangelization and renewal. Mike is the author of Prayers for Catholic Men and co-author of God Is, A One-Day Journey Closer to God. As a speaker, author, and leader of parish retreats and missions, Mike seeks to clearly and enthusiastically communicate the joy found in Christ. Mike, let's start with your a little bit about your upbringing as a... Well, you tell you tell the audience as a what? <laughs> I tell you, you, I tell you, Eddie, you have an old bio. I've done a few more things since. <laughs> yeah, hey, update update the uh, the audience with that. Well, this is the first thing that came up for you, Mike. <laughs> I've written a couple other books, so uh, I wrote Mercy and Hope that uh, was um, co published by both um, Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute, and I also. Um, Last year, dropped a new book, um, The Three Comings of Christ, uh, an ad a daily Advent journey. So uh, we'll, we'll make that. sure that uh, the good thing is we'll make sure that all those links go into the description of the video. Awesome. So, awesome. awesome. And, and then uh, I'm also the, uh, which is going to weave into my story. So it's important that people aren't completely surprised. But uh, I'm the president of Five Stones, which is a Catholic apostolate that serves um, serves the church by providing business services to uh, all sorts of Catholic apostolates. And it is, it'll be an interesting part of the story as well. So excellent. 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 Um, so how did it all, how did it all begin, Mike? Uh, well, it uh, began in Oak Park, Illinois. So uh, I was um, born to a very, very devout Catholic family, actually. Um, my mom and Ben were very, very Catholic, uh, loved the faith, raised us in the faith. And, you know, it's kind of, I think, more popular nowadays a lot. Um, where uh, devout families see Catholic schools as, well, maybe they're the right option, maybe they're not the right option, but you don't really need somebody else to raise your children in the, in the faith. Uh, back in the 1920s when I was born, well, at least the 60s, uh, <laughs> you know, it kind of was more the norm that if you were a devout Catholic family, you sent your kids to the Catholic school. And there was a, there was a great Catholic school uh, our parish had, but it was huge and it was so overcrowded. My parents, um, we had great public schools. My parents were like, no, you know, we don't, I don't really need somebody else to raise our kids in the faith. And they raised us very well, uh, raised us really, really well uh, in the faith. So um, that's kind of how it started. Had uh, a lot of great opportunities, kind of one of those great idyllic childhoods of, um, you know, uh, fun in the sun and not care in the world. And, um, you know, went to a public grammar school, was raised in the faith, went to uh great Catholic high school uh, in Chicago area called Fenwick. And um, so it, it it all started great. Um, somebody who was, you know, brought to daily mass a lot of times during Advent and Lent regards, you know, besides on Sundays. Uh, we weren't one of these, you know, really awesome families that got down on our knees on broken glass and prayed the rosary every single night. But uh, always in the car, always whenever we were going somewhere, we'd always pray the rosary together. Still devout. You can still be devout without the uh, shards of glass. Yeah. So. Well, you know, we did so that. You, you put a little glass on your knees. That's that's what our lady wants from you. You know. So. Uh, and the hair shirt. The hair shirt's always yeah, nice. That's too, key. You know? That's key. Yeah. yeah. So uh, no, but we, you know, my mom and dad were daily rosary prayers, and you know, we prayed it a lot. And I'll tell you, you know, kind of a just a neat story. I don't know if you're the people who who follow this find interesting, but we had kind of like looking back, something that was really cool. And for anybody who's a young parent, something that was really neat was we had a great Sunday ritual. And our Sunday ritual was uh, we'd go to mass and we'd come from back, back from mass and, you know, the kids would go play for a while. You'll get changed, go play uh, in the living room, you know? Uh, and um, my dad would always make brunch and then we'd go in and Barring almost never, one of the major topics of conversation that took up most of the, the family brunch was a discussion of the homily. And, and we did that every Sunday. And it would just totally reinforce the mass and reinforced from a very young age. You know, when you're young and you're looking at your older brother, I was the baby of the family. I had uh, three siblings. But, you know, whatever 
is important to your parents when you're young, whatever is important to your family really becomes important to you. So I kind of grew up this this whole concept that the mass was really important and what was going on in the mass was really important. And, you know, the gospel and the, the readings and, and the homily, you know, as you get older, especially, it's so easy to be distracted. But even as a kid, you can be distracted. But I had so many cues in my life telling me that this was really important. That's fantastic. Uh, and yes, there are a lot of um, young families that listen. So that's that's great. And that really well, helps I, me. I too. recommend that one. I recommend that. It just, it's just it's a great habit to get into. So um, being the youngest, did you, were the other siblings, I guess, um, as, were they paying as much of attention as you were? It's kind of funny. You look back at points of your life and you realize just how, well, I'm going to look at my whole life, including now, one of my greatest sins is self-absorption and the lack of understanding of what other people, I don't know. You know, it's funny. I took for granted that everybody was. And while my siblings all, you know, still practice the faith, you know, I definitely, you know, they didn't become complete Jesus freaks, like, you know, like myself and my wife. So, you know, apparently the seed got planted a little bit deeper in me, or maybe it just comes from my, you know, I, you know, I, I was the pleaser as the youngest or something. I don't know. So yeah, I think they got it. Um, there's no doubt they were, they all understand the faith. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, or maybe just, you know, it's God's grace that uh, it just, it seemed to have really touch me. I want to say in a deep way. I don't want to judge, you know, where they are in their faith walks. But um, yeah, and it's probably a really important thing for later on, because we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ways I've wandered and some of the ways I've come back. But you know, Jesus talks about that, that, that seed planted in rich soil. And, I, you know, through no, at that point, through, through nothing on my part, the seed was planted in great soil. And it was planted well, and it was watered, and it was tended, and it was weeded. You know, so um, praise God. Yeah, amen. Absolutely. Okay, so middle school, let's just jump forward to like middle yeah. school. So you're still doing the... Um, the middle school is where it becomes strange. Middle school is where something starts happening. I'm still, Mr. Kenneth, but you know, my life is going to be, you know, I don't know. I love these people, you know, that, that wander off. They have the great stories. You know, they were Catholic. They they left the faith. They, you know, they went apostate. They murdered 40 people, you know. Oh, the common, to, yeah, you're common, typical. You know, you're, the common reversion stories, you know. Yeah. And then they came flying back and they got elevated to the heights of heaven, you know. Um, I have more what I really think a lot of people experience where I have, I had a slow falling away in certain ways and and yet not really. And what I really fell into, and maybe it'll res resound with some people, is a duplicity where I found myself, my true reversion is a story of coming back to unity within myself, you know, where I, in some ways, absolutely ran away from God. And in some ways, whatever was planted in me, I kept that one foot in the door. And, you know, I was always open to God, you know, bringing me back. So one of the things that's kind of an important thing that hits in uh, middle school, um, I think now, unfortunately, happens at much younger ages, is um, I, I will I will keep the names uh, anonymous, but one of my neighbors had a you know one of one of my little buddies under his front porch had the you know three foot stack of Playboys and other um, you know other uh, you know forms of pornography, and you know I'm in maybe fifth sixth grade seventh grade somewhere right around there, and all of a sudden you know you're 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 seeing this and you're seeing these images and I didn't understand sexuality and so I'm being taught sexuality from a really distorted horrible viewpoint and, you know and, and and obviously a lot of psychologists you know have studied this and they talk about what it does to your you know your your brain chemicals and the pathways the neural pathways this becomes so emblazoned in your brain you know and yeah. and it turns yeah. out you you, you we do have natural law. We we know it's wrong, but we don't understand. You know, at that age, I just remember being so confused. I knew it was wrong, but I was so confused too. So, kind of, you know, to some extent, you know, I got hooked on pornography before I. I really had a full understanding of of what was happening, you know, to me. Yeah, I've heard that from a from a lot of people, and I'm assuming the friends that were. 
it wasn't just you in other words there's probably oh, yeah. a, a no, no, group no, no, no. a group a group of um yeah little guys getting together yeah, um, yeah. i mean i i just think of reading augustine and whether it's the stealing of the pear yeah. or when they go to that gladiator event there's this I hate, the, I hate the Augustine thing. I'm like, if he really thinks that stealing a pair was that bad, my gosh, he should come and sit in some of my confessions, you know? I wish that's all I had to confess was stealing a pair. Stealing a pair, yeah. 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 But oh you see gosh. my point. It was it was this camarader <laughs> it was the camaraderie that was occurring around yeah. the thing that you knew was wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was like the, it was a takeout library because then, of course, you try to you know, sneak one in your house and then you have to bring it back to the library and sneak another one in your house. Same, you know? same idea. Exactly. Yeah. Um, OK, so that that carried you into yeah. high school. Oh, oh that's what I was going to ask you. So during that time, were you still, I'm assuming so, going I mean, to. Oh, to my gosh. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. I, I didn't I didn't understand. Like this is, you know, and I think, you know, it's kind of interesting thing about sin in your life. You know, there's they're full of sin to sin. And there's, you know, kind of a lesser ascent to sin. And, and, and even to a lesser extent, it can still be sinful, but, you know, it might be, you know, how grave is the matter. Um, but, you know, there's the old story, which isn't true, but the old story people have heard about the, the frog in the water, you know, and you slowly turn the water yeah, up, yeah. and all of a sudden you're boiling and you're dead. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. And remember, this don't make this my whole life. I'm still, great things are happening in my life. But on the other hand, you know, to this day, I feel so bad for any, any, I'll speak to boys, any young boy who's in sixth, seventh, seventh grade is the weirdest time, I think, in any, any boy's life. You are, the hormones start raging, you got no idea what the heck's going on. You're just weird, okay? So, so this is definitely not a full ascent to sin. This is not a full, you know, the, the water, you know, boiling and the frog is just dead. It's just, it's the seeds, you know? On the other hand, still, you know, Okay, but on the other hand, you just you start ready a little seventh and eighth grader, you know, kind of like don't know where you are, and you know, maybe you know, a little uh, you know, stealing from the candy store or this or that, or all just those little things that are just kind of sneaking in. But you know, on the other hand, still have um a young, somewhat immature, but loving, kind of childlike, you know, relationship with God at this point. And um, and yeah, and that's 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 still strong. You know, it's kind of like uh, the innocence is sneaking away, but but the love is still there. You know. Well, to your point, you still have a foot. You still have a foot in the door, and you have. See, the, at that point, I have my whole body in the door, and I'm just sneaking one foot out. At one point, foot. You know? so, yeah. so that carried into college. Um, well, first let's go to high school. High school is a very yeah. interesting point because now high school was kind of the reversion. So I had this slight little sneaking without knowing it. And now high school, I had this amazing experience. I went to this great Catholic high school. And again, you know, you look at people, and I think as you, you as you get older, um, and, you know, I am older, I'm, I'm living the Billy Crystal thing. I look better than I feel. But, uh, you know, I, I, I look back, and I, I look at the experience that I had in high school, and I'm like, why didn't everybody who had the Dom Dominican, you know, um, priest that we had and this great education at this amazing all boys school. Why didn't every grow up loving our Lord like I did? Because I, I look back at, at just, I'm coming on my, um, well, this weekend, I'm supposed to go to my 40th um, reunion for high school. And uh, I'm just like, this place was amazing. And I learned so much about the faith. It's funny because I went out to get a, you know, master's in theology later on in my life. And that'll come up later. And I, there's so many times people will ask me, I'll say something, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's, yeah, well, you, you know that because you have a master's in theology. And I'll say, I learned that in high school. Wow. wow. Now, I think what it was, was I, it, it, it meant something to me. So I paid attention and I remembered it from high school, you know. So it, it was, it was amazing. So I got, you know, we had this great school. Um, if you wanted to, you know, go, I could, you could go to daily mass uh, during your lunch hour and still like, slap your lunch down quickly in about 15 minutes, which I did most of the time. Again, Bob, that was, you know, I served at mass and did things like that. Um, my dad was, uh, well, he's, he still is because he's still alive at 89, is a supernumerary of Opus Dei. So I started, you know, having that influence as well. So I was getting spiritual direction. I was going to confession. So now, okay, the pornography is there, you know, the, the falls are there, but I'm running back, you know, I'm, 
and, and crying, you know, and I'm, I'm very remorseful. So I'd say that in a lot of, I'm in a really good place. I'm thinking about the priesthood at that point. You know, I mean, that's kind of, that was my desire throughout high school. I wanted to be a priest, either the military or the priest, probably then didn't really have a military background in my family. So I'm like, okay, a priest. So, uh, so no, high school was this really good filling time, you know, so, you know, it's going to start falling apart a little bit. It's in college. So I don't know if you want to get to that. No, 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 no. I want to know. How, so you, you enter college again. This is, you talk about a weird time for a seventh grader. I'd, I'd argue that the weird time for many <laughs> boys becoming men is all the way through, all the way through college. Yeah. I I would argue it's very weird, yeah. but yeah, how was it for you? No, I'm with you on that, and I think one you know I read a lot of books about this too. Is one of the things in our culture is very interesting, and a lot of groups are trying to both Christian and and Catholic Christian groups are trying to say, well, when does a when does a a young when does a boy become a man, and what is the right, you know? And it's something that definitely, if you look back in society, there were very you know delineated movements, and you were told, okay, now you have to take upon responsibility. But, you know, we're seeing this right now in society. It's very sad where, first of all, what adolescence is, is a, a fairly new invention, a term. Even. What, what is an adolescent? There wasn't that concept. You were either a kid or you were an adult. You know, you going back, go back years ago. And now this whole concept that, you know, even adolescence, even when it started coming in, now you're an adolescent in college. I mean, you know. I, I majored in fraternity, you know, in a lot yeah, of ways yes. in, in, in college. And you can sit there and you're, you know, you, you have very little. You, I look back when I was, you know, working and going for my master's in theology, how easy it was to get my work done later on in my life when I knew how to manage my time well. And um, so you're sitting there in college, just partying, playing, having fun. Yeah, you got to do some studying on the side. So you have to grow up. And now we all know kind of this whole push in society like, yeah, well, either don't get married, you know, never grow up, yeah, never yeah. have any responsibility, or uh, play for the I'll play throughout co high school, college. I'll play for the next five to ten years. I'll sleep around, and yeah, then I'll go find somebody when I'm 35, 36, or whatever. You know, and uh, yeah, what you said is true. Just and it just keeps getting pushed further and further back. And I'm. Did you have an event in college? I th I thought you had mentioned something to me. Some interesting um part of college that was another seed so to speak or or maybe the seed was coming to that's interesting you say that i don't remember telling you but in thinking about this this morning i, I was thinking I said, there, there was an interesting thing so I, I go to college and i think you know i was kind of a little what they call late bloomer so you know i i wasn't <laughs> I, I didn't quite have the attributes that I would have liked to in high school to be really popular or have a lot of girls return uh, my admiration for them. Uh, you know, started getting a little better by senior year. In college, I started coming to my own, you know? So uh, so I went crazy. And I know, you know, look, don't make this like I was complete down one. I wasn't. A lot of it was, you know, based in kind of a very emotional, very oh, kind of loving way. I was falling in love left and right. Not always in lust. You know, yeah, there was lust too, you know? So, but I went crazy in college and I joined a fraternity that, you know, quite frankly, I'm not going to mention the name or this, sure. but I'm not proud of it. And I think it was probably the worst choice. You can never, regret's an interesting thing. I don't regret meaning I want to go back and change it. I am who I am because of all the things I've done. And, you know, God absolutely brings out good from, from evil. And God always, you know, the old trite phrase, God writes, you know, straight with crooked lines. But my fraternity, you know, this is an important part of my, you know, the need to revert. This is where I really was broken into in a lot of ways, because in some respects, I'm still Catholic. I'm still Mr. Catholic. I'm still, you don't lose your, your knowledge, you don't lose your sense of right. And I was, you know, had a certain religious discipline. So I'm still going to mass throughout college. In fact, in Advent and Lent, I'm still going to daily mass. On the other hand, I am absolutely not pure. I am drinking everything. I am partying. I am using language. I am not treating, you know, racial, you know, epithets, you know, all these different things. I mean, I am in some respects, I look at myself and, I, and I've really had to do a lot of healing over this. I look at myself mm -hmm. and I'm embarrassed. I, I, I hate myself. I hate that part of me. I look back at those years and I, we all have to forgive ourselves for that. It's absolutely important because God's mercy is infinite. But I'm telling you, Eddie, 
there were two Mike Pacers at that point. You know, one is just Mr. Fraternity, Mr. Partier, Mr. Just getting sucked down this line of inappropriate thoughts, words, and behavior. But somehow, you know, God's love, God's grace still existed. So that was really freshman and sophomore year. And I really feel felt like I kind of realized that I was spiraling. I, I kind of was spiraling. Some, some pretty bad and embarrassing things that happened, you know, just things where I just, you know, look back at them, they're just horrible. Um, but for whatever reason, I realized there was something in me, you know, and I think we all have these voices, but we actually have to listen to them. And something just hit me that I have to get out of here. And long after I should, I think it was like something like March of, you know, my sophomore year, the program's completely closed. Somehow I talked my way into the study abroad program, like three, four months after it was closed. And next thing you know, I was my junior year. I spent my entire junior year abroad at a, a university in Wales. Um, and I think two of the most important things that happened while I was there was, you know, nowadays we're so used to like, you know, my son right now is in Rome. Uh, just he and a bunch of his uh, bunch of his best friends from seminary are all over in Rome together. They've all been a priest now for like one, two or three years and they're spending time. If I wanted to call him right now, I could call him. If I wanted to text him, I could text him. When I was there for a year, I didn't come back over Christmas. For me to try to talk to my parents maybe once a month, I was like putting pound coins, you know, into a, a payphone and trying to get my conversation done in about five to 10 minutes and that was it. So one of the things was being lonely and being alone. And I remember being, you know, in a train station in Germany um, in, you know, coming into Christmas time. Or I think this, no, this was right after Christmas. I'd spent Christmas in London and just being profoundly lonely and just crying my eyes out, but, but talking to God. You know, and realizing, and I don't think I had this complete realization the way I'm looking at it now, but realizing that we, you know, we, we always hear about the fulfilling ourselves with everything, you know, hear the, the, the phrase about, you know, we have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. We shove everything, drugs, alcohol, music, just distraction, work, school, anything, but nothing's going to fill it. And it's, if we ever could stop for a moment and realize, you know what, I'm insanely unhappy at this moment. I think even if we don't realize the answer at that moment, it opens us up to realize that nothing I'm doing is going to completely fulfill me. And at that moment, I was crying. I was just talking to God. And I'm not saying there was this golden moment. I slowly got over it. I felt better. I went on and, you know, met some people, I think, wherever I was going at that moment. But I think that was very important. And I'll tell you one other moment that just kind of was like a little seed for later on. I was in London um, with a friend of mine who came from a very wealthy family, and we were at a, um, a gentleman's club. Now, people are thinking about a different type of gentleman's club um, than that, but we're in this club where it's, you know, it's an all men's dinner club and this and that, where you have gold leaf on the ceiling. Uh, Prince Andrew was a member, you know, of this club, the uh, RAC Palmal, and just eating all this food and drinking all this incredible wine and then going to this private club afterwards. And I didn't even know what was going on because I was drunk as a monkey at that point. But we were paying like ridiculous amounts of money. And I didn't have a lot of money, but we were paying it anyways. And we were buying these girls that were with us, all these weird things. And I didn't realize that we were actually not buying them, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We were just happening to be buying these overpriced things that they weren't using. And then they were ours for the night. Oh. And I, and all of a sudden, the realization hit it, hit me. And you know, my body's like, okay, time to go. And I'm like, no, 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 time to go. I got up and I grabbed them and I ran out. Now, you know, the next morning woke up with an incredible hangover, um, both physical, spiritual, and fear of, oh my gosh, how much did I spend last night? And how am I going to, you know, deal with that? And I was in the, uh, I was in the train station in London. 
and he was actually was going to come back the next day or something. And I remember, you know, this guy came by, and you know, he was a well, an indigent guy, and you know, put his hand out, whatever. And I just turned away, and I got on the train. And all of a sudden, I realized how much money I had spent the last night, and I just, I, the floodgates opened. I broke down, and I, I just, I went running off the train. I was like flying around the station looking for that guy. I would have given him every single thing I had at that moment, and I couldn't. I didn't find him. And I, I got on that train just broken, you know. And again, you know, I don't know, that's an amazing story or whatever, but it meant something to me. And I, and I, I realized, you know, you think about later on, you're like, whether metaphorically or actually, that was Christ at that moment. You know, Christ came to me and he gave me a chance. And I said, no, you know. So I'd say those are two points that were uh, pretty important, you know, that you just kind of, you file them away and they have, they, they come back, you know, later on in my life. Whoa, Mike, that was fantastic. So you finished college. This is what I, why don't we talk about the transition into the full on yeah. career as a lawyer and how that, how that started. So I get my, I get straightened out. Really, the great thing about going away, it came in. I'm like, well, I can't go back in the fraternity. I'm getting an apartment. And I was actually an apartment with two grad students. So they were architectural grad students. I mean, you know, they were fun guys. And we had a lot of fun. I'm not saying, <laughs> I didn't give up drinking. I'm Catholic. I'm not Baptist. But, uh, you know, but I got serious. And then I realized, well, you know, I was pre-med biology. And I'm like, I don't want to be a doctor. What am I doing? Um, uh I like arguing. Uh, let's, let's become a lawyer. So, uh, so pre-med, pre-law, what's the difference in the old animal house, uh, you know, question. So, uh, so I went on, you know, really just got my biology degree, but just boom, took the LSAT, got everything lined, got everything taken care of, um, got out of there and, you know, went to law school. Um, my senior year, so when I came back that fall, I was changed. You know, I just, I knew that I was ready to move on in my life. And so on December 6th, uh, that year, I met, um, uh, I was set up with uh, a girl for a dance. I'd never been set up before. There was always about, I had a list of 10 different girls. I went this one, then this one, this, you know, but no, I had nobody. I'm like, I don't care. I went to my roommates and just set me out with somebody. So I went to this dance with her, it was a fraternity dance. And next morning, uh, I was asked by my roommates, so what'd you think? I said, well, I met Mrs. Pacer last night. So um, I literally fell in love in you know, first sight. And she took some convincing, by the way, she, it, it, you know, she was more love at eighth sight, but, you know, <laughs> but, I, but I wore her down. I wore, I'm very persistent, Eddie. So I wore her down and uh, 34 years later, she's still with, well, actually 34 years of marriage later. So about 36 years later, she's still with me. Fantastic. Uh, so graduated, got married and started doing all the right. Things. I mean, um, we got married between my second, third year of law school. We um, you know, got married, started having kids. I'm working for this big Chicago law firm. I'm working my butt off. I'm doing well. Um, I become a partner. I become the managing partner of one of our small offices. I've got a country club membership. I got it all going on. And at the same time, okay, we're involved in the parish. I'm helping out with, you know, um, youth ministry, you know, we're running this huge rummage sale. We're in charge of it. It, it. it was massive. Different parishional areas would take over for 10 years. You know, you'd have a thousand volunteers that you're, you know, in charge of all that. It's just crazy stuff. And here's where the duplicity is back again. Because in some ways, I'm Mr. Catholic. I'm going to daily mass a lot of days. I were Pillars of the community, pillars of the parish. And yet, Eddie, I was so full of myself. It was all about the law. It was all about who I am. And I'm saying the law like I love the law. I loved being a lawyer. And we can make lawyer jokes or whatever we want, but the reality is we hold up lawyers in great, you know, great esteem. You go to a you go to a party, you know, somebody's a lawyer, they start asking you questions because we know everything there is to know about everything. Not really, but we know how to lie a lot and say it with a very straight face so we convince people that we actually know what we're talking about. 
I'm sitting there being a litigator. I'm. Uh, this is not a brag. I mean, because realistically, as a defense attorney in civil matters, if you're a good lawyer, you never go to trial if you if you can if you think you're going to lose to some extent. Or you know, and of course you can still lose a case, but I mean, you should be preparing, you should be getting ready, you should settle the case if need be. But I went in there every case. I didn't try a lot of cases. I tried a bunch of cases, and I went and loaded for bear. And while, yeah, I believed in my side, I wanted to kill the other person. I wanted to, and I planned every single little thing that happened in that courtroom. Every little act, every little going for the water, holding the door for the other counsel, everything. And it was all about control and winning and power. And, you know, the reality is I was shirking a lot of my fatherly duties too, I justified it. Whoa, no, no, I gotta gotta go with clients. Gotta go. These guys weren't gonna send me any more business, you know. I just wanted to go golf, uh, and just arrogance, self-absorption. So here's where I really started getting split in two, because you know. And, and by the way, the pornography is not completely gone, you know. I never really took care of that, you know. It's you kind of go back and forth, and you know it's bad, and you do the cold showers or whatever. You know, but uh, I, I never healed, you know, and so it was up and back and good and bad, you know, this and that. So I, Mike Pacer is really the truly split into at this point, and it's almost like I'm two different people. So my sort of reversion is not that I completely left, it's that half of me left, half stayed, but you're both shell. You know, if you have two halves, both of them are shells of a people, of a person. You know, if to the outside world only seeing one side or the other, you know, they it looks like you're all good. But from 2000 to 2003, I was, we have depression in my family, anxiety. I was, uh, you know, the whole nine yards. I mean, for, for those, you know, uh, of your followers that, you know, have lived through anxiety and depression or those who haven't or have seen it, don't understand it. Let me just tell you at a certain point right now where I'm, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if I was quite a partner. Yeah, no, I was a partner at this point. So I'm in, you know, the smaller office. We had a big, large Chicago office, and we got a smaller office out here in Wheaton, Illinois. And so I wake up in the morning, and you go to the bathroom, and I'm just dry heaving. And then I'm putting my suit and tie and wing tips on and get in the car, and I'm maybe going to court right away, or maybe I'm going to the office. Well, I actually went to the office first of all, and then maybe pulling over and dry heaving a couple of times on the way to the office. And I got to get in there before anybody else because I can't let anyone know. And I got to be the hardest worker. So I got to be there before anybody else. But there's times in the day I'm closing you know, my door and crying my eyes out. I get through lunchtime. I have to get out at lunchtime because I'm just, you know, I'm just beside myself, you know, crying and this and that and what's going on. You, you get home, you run past your kids. And <laughs> it sounds kind of funny. But you hear about the, you know, like craw just crawling into a corner and crying. I, I literally crawled into a corner and cried. Now, I never missed a day of work. I never, you know, didn't do anything I had to do. But it was help, you know. So with help, a little bit of medication, with some, a great priest who was a also a um, a PhD psych, uh, really, really helped me through that. But you can see this. So all this is going in. Mental illness is multifactorial. It's, you know, yes, yeah, partially genetic, yes, yeah, partially chemical, it's partially situational. So all these things are going on. So I get through that, but you think I'd be a lot better. So that was, you know, a really bad, you know, four or five months or something like that. But even after that, I just still felt bad. And what kept coming to me is I can't keep doing this. What I realized is, you know, I set up this whole world, but the way I looked at it, all I was doing was fighting. My whole, my whole goal in life was just to win, to beat the other person. And I, I'm like, wait a second. So now all of a sudden I realize this duplicity. I'm Mr. Catherine, go to mass, love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, et cetera. And look at me, I'm telling the jokes. I'm so awesome. I'm the big powerful guy. I'm proving myself. I'm kicking everyone's ass in court, you know, blah, 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 you know? So in 2003, finally ended up with th three years of hell, really. But Lori and I ended up at a retreat together. And in this time, we'd actually started slowly growing together. What we realized is, 
you know, another thing for young couples is, I think what happens a lot of times, one of the toughest things, you know, you get, you marry somebody, and let's say they're, they're even similar to you. You think you're so much alike until you get married, and then you realize that your spouse is crazy. How could you possibly push, you know, toothpaste from the middle? Everyone knows that it is a cardinal sin not to roll it up from the bottom. Who would ever think of washing the dishes in the left side of the, of the sink? I, I mean, are you sick? Are you crazy? Are you demented? You wash the dishes in the right, and then you dry them in the left. Everyone knows that, right? You know? So you go through these things, you get through the silly things. But then what you really realize is it's kind of funny that if you both believe to some extent in God, the hardest, most personal thing is your, is your faith life. Now, if you don't have a faith life, it's not true. But if you both came from different bearing faith lives, it's like, wait a second. My way of praying is the right way to pray. And by the way, God would not want me to change. You know? Yeah. So what finally started happening in this, you know, this time was we started doing some things together. We started, you know, doing like the same type of retreat and started, and I'd say finally after, you know, 10 years of marriage, 11 years of marriage, for the first time, we really started praying together rather than next to each other. So we found ourselves on this retreat um, in 2003, and um, we were supposed to go from our parish to be the leadership team to receive it and then start putting it on in our parish. And we both went in with very intentional. I went in because I realized, look, I can't keep doing this. I don't think I'm supposed to be a lawyer anymore, at least not this type of lawyer. I don't think I'm supposed to be a litigator. I can't, I can't keep this up. So I went with this question to God, like, what do you want me to do? And Lori, you know, who had kind of been raised as more of a... Um, a cultural Catholic, her family was, you know, you go to Catholic schools, you go to mass on Sundays, but that's it. You know, Lori had one joke uh, growing up that, you know, she, one day she's sitting at the dinner table and all of a sudden in the name of the father, son, and the Holy spirit, she's looking around. What? what? Oh, that's right. Grandma's here. Bless us. Oh Lord. And he's like, yes. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, so she, our kids are starting to go through the sacraments, you know? Um, and, so she went into it asking God, okay, you know, do I really believe this stuff? You know, what am I going to do if I actually really believe this stuff? And her big question was, okay, God, what are my gifts and how do you want me to use them to serve you? Now she would say later on, if she were on your show, it's like, eh, really, what are my gifts? You know? <laughs> so uh, we had, um, I don't want to go into it too much, but we had a pretty miraculous moment. So we're sitting and talking about the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't like by any means, like any good retreat should be it's even like a good a good mission should really be very intentional to you know talk yeah, i'm very very into the charismatic proclamation so you start out with god's love and you and you, you let people know that you're loved you're beautiful you're awesome in god's eyes but then you got to talk about sin you got to kind of break people down and let them know but but we're, we're broken we're flawed because of original sin because of personal sin because of the sin of others you know and then you know go to the salvation uh, of jesus you know, jesus saves you and then get to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will transform you. And you kind of build, and there's always a good retreat. We kind of have this point where it you know, builds you, break you, builds you, sends you forth. So the good thing about God is when a guy wants to get your attention, he doesn't follow somebody else's plan. So he hit us at a talk that I think was, and by the way, the guy who gave this talk is a really good friend of mine now. Um, he was not a great public speaker. He loves our Lord. And it was, I would have thought, probably the most boring talk of the entire retreat. But it was about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so God took that moment to just knock us both over. We're sitting in different parts of the room. When I even sit next to each other at the exact same moment, when I'm talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Lori is just in ecstasy. She, she hears God say, these are your gifts, Lori. You've always had them. You've just chosen not to lose them. And I hear, you know, you know, I don't hear words at this point, but like, Mr. Catholic, have, you know, have you ever once prayed to the Holy Spirit consciously in your entire life? You're so full of yourself. You think you know the faith so well, and you've ignored one third of your God. Now, theologically, if you're praying to God at all, you're praying to all three of them, but this is an emotional, this is a get through mic. So I go to the chapel and I say, God, you know, I, I, I just can't keep doing this. I know you don't want me to do this. What do you want me to do? And I hear, 
And this is, you know, I doubt this myself, but I we wrote it down at the time. You, know, you, you almost can't believe it. I mean, burning bush, I heard the words. Not like in my mind. I heard the words, just leave. Okay? Now, you have to understand, I'm in, I didn't know anything that happened with Lori. And I also look up at this moment, and I and I and I I, I hear these words. I'm just blessed, and all of a sudden, I'm overcome. This is the release. I'm crying. I'm no longer convicted that you know, God's not mad at me about the Holy Spirit. God is offering me. He's talking. I mean, God is literally speaking words to me. And of course, I you know get over this. Have this moment. I know something amazing is happening. I look over, and Lori's in the chapel. Neither of us knew we were in the chapel. She's going through her God moment. I'm going through my God moment. I mean, her mascara was all over the place. I had to kind of figure out who it was. Kind of looked like a raccoon for a while there. But um, so this was the beginning. Um, we went through a year of discernment. We went through a year of my almost, you know, killing Lori because I'm an attorney. And I, I analyzed the words just leave for almost a year. But uh, with miracles from St. Therese, from so many different things on the Feast of St. Therese 2004, uh, I resigned my partnership with uh, three young boys, having no idea what I was going to do next. What was the, um, I think I may have asked you this before. What was, do you remember the emotion on that day where you just walk away from the office and you're going to head home? Yep, I do. So I had actually changed um, law firms a couple years earlier. Um my firm decided to bring all of our offices back into the, the city and get rid of our Collar County offices. And at this point, the boys getting a little older. I was starting to coach baseball and stuff. I couldn't handle a commute. There's no, I just was not willing to commute the hour that it would take me at least door to door. So I went to another firm doing, it was a spinoff from a firm that was almost, you know, carbon copy of the firm I was with. So it was in the, the same office complex. So I went from a firm to another firm that was built the same way, ran the same way, doing the same types of work, brought a bunch of my own clients, other clients that were there, with the same types of clients I worked for. Uh, and I was so nervous about that. When I walked in, and of course, again, there was a St. Therese miracle here, why it had to be a, I tried to, for three days, I tried to go to the managing partner uh, of that office and resign. I couldn't because he was out of town, out of town. And finally he was, you know, there on the, on the feast of St. Therese and, another story but uh, uh unless your, your fan if your fans are all big Trez freaks and i can tell a little bit of it when i resigned that oh when i resigned the first time from my firm going to the exact same salary exact same work same office complex i was so incredibly nervous when i walked in and resigned and not even knowing well, how was i going to raise my family how was i going to pay my mortgage it was the most peaceful thing i've ever done in my life And your wife was obviously on board. Did the kids know? Completely. <laughs> no, they couldn't quite understand. Now, you, you know, you, you, you hide things from your kids and you slowly reveal them, you know. Um, so, no. And, and, and again, don't make me out to be this incredible saint because, look, first of all, for the good of my clients, I didn't walk out of, like, here's all the files, goodbye. I, you know, I slowly wound things down over several months, you know, but. So as a practical matter, I knew that like the next week, it wasn't going to be like I wasn't going to have a, a paycheck. But I, a paycheck was going to end at some point, and I didn't know when. You know, yeah. um, you know, the reality is I made the decision. I mean, there was no question in my mind. I was gone. And it's kind of funny because it was only a couple weeks later. You know, we, we've been building through this for the last year. And Lori had talked to her friends a little bit, but Lori wanted to, she had to come clean. You know, she had never told her friends the full story, everything. You know, they, they were figuring these things out. So she invited them over. It was, uh, it was a Friday morning. And um, she invited her friends over and it was going to be a come support me tea. It just seems like a, a girl thing. I, I don't understand it, but you have female listeners. They're probably like, oh, I know totally what that is. That's a cool thing. Oh, it's so beautiful. And like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. So come support me too. So, um, so she wanted to get her friends, you know, who are all Catholic, but you know, varying levels. She wanted them just to pray a rosary. 
and she's like, they're there, and they're, you know, like, you, before you start anything, you're milling about, milling about, and then the milling about's taking a little longer, a little longer, and she's not really getting to the, what you really want to have And She's like, how am I going to ask him to do this? And the doorbell rings, okay? And it's a friend of mine from the health club, an elderly woman from the health club. Um, and uh, this woman says, you know, I know Mike's been really unhappy. I know he's been contemplating. She didn't know that I actually resigned yet. I know that Mike's been contemplating something else. I think Mike should be doing Catholic ministry work. He probably needs to go get some other type of degree and this will help. And she handed Lori an envelope. And it was a check made payable to me in the amount of $20,000. Oh, this woman is an agnostic Jew who lost her family in Auschwitz. Oh my gosh. She got war reparations money. She's always used it for uh, medical. She would never touch the money. It's blood money. She's used it for um, medical scholarships. That year, she used it to get uh, some Catholic kid a uh, master's in theology. Oh, that blows me away. That's fantastic. Oh, man. Uh, all right, Mike, where do we go okay, from here? Way, that, 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 is, that is remarkable. Lori was able. To, Lori was able to get her friends to say the rosary at that moment. Right? Yeah, <laughs> she had the guts to do it at that moment. Oh, that's incredible! No, oh. Funny story about Lori before that was Lori's like Lori. The reason that she was getting so all constant, she started. She she was always in charge of the finance. She's looking at, you know, the finances, and she was like, Lord, you know, she was like, you know, if it might stop today, you've got two months, Lord, and then he's got to go back to work. And Lori always jokes about like when she got the, the check, she goes, okay, Lori, just bought yourself two more months. <laughs> uh, all right. So what, what let's figure out how to land this thing. That is okay. exceptional. We'll land, it. we'll land it. So the next thing is, so the next thing is, and I, and I can kind of go through this because that's more of the fun stuff, but then it's start out a new course and the course is still going to this day. So first of all, started out in, okay, what do you have to give up? When you're going to follow God, you have to look at your life and you have to be ready to give up everything. And it's so hard. And for us to make this, one of the things that was so hard for me to do the just leave thing was to start looking at what couldn't I give up. And for me, the hardest thing was the house. I just love the house. Not that we have some incredible house, but you know, the house that you're raising your children in, that you have been paying for, it's, it's just means something to them. And for Lori, it was the garden. She, we've got this you know, not a big lot, but I mean, this really wooded lot, beautiful with lots that have been really been working on so hard with her dad, trying to, you know, tame this wild beast and get beautiful flowers. And we both had to like be willing to give it up. And so we both said, okay, God, I'll, I'll leave the house. And Lori, and you know what house we're still living in today. God, God didn't take the house, but we had to do it. And then one of, one of the tough things is, you know, your money. And like, we never tithe. I mean, always given money. We finally started tithing, truly tithing, where the first uh, Monday of every month, we just look whatever money we got, giving away 10%, when we were in our lowest amount of income in our lives. Yeah, no, that's when we finally started. We truly gave God our money. Identity was the toughest thing in the world. An attorney, I remember years later, after we, Lori and I, we, we, so we started doing ministry work, and we did that for years. And uh, then, you know, God, so I remember first kid hit high school, uh, my son, uh, Nate. And the question was, what does your dad do? I'm an evangelizer. I'm I evangel. I just say I'm an attorney. I mean, I realized it was so hard to give up that identity as an attorney years later after I'd left. Then the next thing was my children. I mean, Laura and I had done, you know, family consecrations and I had a couple different times, you know, I was up there. I'm on crucifix in Medjugorje and, oh, I give my children to the, you know, the sacred heart of Jesus for the most immaculate heart of Mary. I didn't believe it. I didn't mean it at all. They were mine. It wasn't until Nate had this incredible, like weird thing where he was going to go to West Point. He was told he was in West Point. He's a senior. It's spring, getting ready. And all of a sudden he's told he's not in West Point. And I'm just freaking out. I don't even know I really wanted him to go to West Point, but I'm freaking out about what's going on, what's going on. I just realized we're about to give a retreat, just a little half-day retreat for his high school, uh, the teachers and stuff. And I just realized I had never given my kids a lot. And I just said at that moment, you know, Mary, Jesus, he's yours. They're yours. You know, so he didn't, <laughs> he didn't go to West Point. He became a priest. 
You know, you know, I mean, so it just had to get out. And it's constant things, you know, it's kind of things. And then even in the ministry. So then, I'm, you know, just the last weird twist in all this is so we get through this time, you know, we're raising our kids at a time like how the heck. And there were there were there were some crazy money miracles over the years, you know. So we're raising our kids. You know, we were thinking about selling one of them, but that wasn't necessary. Um, and so we're raising them through all these times. And they're finally, scholarships jumped out like crazy in college, things they didn't even apply for. They were in their colleges and they didn't apply for additional scholarships and boom, they just came to them, just thing after thing. So we're doing ministry work. Last kids about to graduate from college. We've done our thing. We can go live in a van down by the river now, you know, ministry, et cetera. And then, you know, God calls me to come into this kind of this corporate setting to like take what was Lighthouse Catholic Media, put that into the Augusta Institute, take this company that was Lighthouse Catholic Media and make it this, you know, company that serves the church by providing warehouse and fulfillment, customer service and marketing and all these things. And and, and it's just it's funny because at first I'm like, well, I'll, I'll do it for like six months, two years. I'll, just, I'll be the transition, you know, and then uh, I, I remember. It was the um, the founder of uh, Ignatius Press, Father Fassier. I was at a board meeting one time, and you know, I'm telling him this, and I'm you know, right. I'm like, look, you guys, I can leave now, you know. And he's like, ah, you heard six months to a year. I heard forever, <laughs> you know. And so, so that was done. You don't say no to Father Fassier. So, uh, so it's and it's a constant, you know. So all these things, I think, you know, people tell these beautiful stories of reversion, this moment, you know, with our Lord, and everything changes. I am still this terrible sinner. I'm still self-absorbed. Oh, I will say that the pornography, but the healing came through uh, Christopher West's uh, Theology of the Body. We went on the week-long intensive and to retrain my brain, to, tr- under- to truly come to understand my sexuality and Lori's sexuality and, you know, the just the beauty of, of, of how God created us, you know, a, a reforming, not a breaking, not a breaking of a habit, but a complete changing of my conception of what sexuality is you know so i didn't want to leave uh your your followers you know like oh man he's probably still hooked no i'm not (laughs) but again but all these things you know a one and done reversion story if anyone hears that or tells that it's not real because every single day we get up in the trenches and every day we've got things hitting us and every day it's got to be what am i holding on to what am i failing in and I don't want to be negative. How can I grow closer to God? And so there was this old man senior um, who, uh, for one ministry, the Lord and I worked and a uh, great guy. And I can say that in spite of the fact that he at one point fired Lori and myself. Uh, but he always talk, always talk about constant converting Catholic. He goes, I'm a CCC, I'm constantly converting Catholic. And that's, that's just life. You know, you always have to be looking. How is God speaking to me now? What is God asking me to do, you know, at this point? How can I grow closer? And a lot of times it's not growing closer. How can I accept God who's really desiring to be closer to me? God's the one who's moving and I'm the one who's pushing him away. Very good. good. Appreciate your time very much. Is there anything else you want to leave the uh, audience with? Yeah. One last thing. I just, I don't know. Somebody needs to hear this. God loves you so much. He loves you exactly who you are, how you are. And don't listen to the world. Don't sit there and think, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I, my humor isn't good enough. You are the perfect God, perfect you that God made. And he loves you. And your desire to be better is awesome. But that's even a gift from God. That's a gift from God. And he's so merciful. And I am always trying to prove myself to God. And I'm always beating myself up. And I have to accept God's mercy. And one of the greatest gifts God has given me is to keep reminding me of my weakness. For in my weakness, he is strong. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much for being willing to um, go deep into those topics. Really, really appreciate it. And I pray it's going to help some people that hear this um, 
Again, well, thank yeah. you, Eddie, for what you're doing and for being this great vehicle and for just daily saying fiat and saying, what do you want? And just use me, you know, I appreciate use it. Me, you know, humbly. So thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, everyone, please share and subscribe and comment. And until next time, take care and God bless. Bye.